All right, I got it figured out, folks. We're ready to go. Um, so again, for those of you that are joining us on Zoom, uh, feel free to keep your camera on if you would like. Uh, we love to see your faces. If it becomes a problem with our bandwidth, I will go ahead and shut all of your cameras off for you. Um, and I have muted all of you when you arrived and I have taken away your ability to unmute yourselves. Um, so if we want you to, this sounds like a terrible thing to say, but if we want you to talk, we'll let you know and we will unmute you individually <laughs> um, just so that it's easier um, for folks that are listening in, um, having people be able to unmute themselves. Sometimes it happens accidentally and we get a lot of background noise. So um, please feel free to keep yourselves on mute. Um, let's see, looks like we are set and ready to go live on, on Facebook. So hello everybody, my name is Ashley. I am the Community Engagement Project Manager here at Napa County Resource Conservation District. Um, and really quickly, I know we've done this many times and for those of you who tune in to all of our programs, you've heard me say this, I don't know how many times over the past year, but um, let's go over a bit of protocol. For those of you on Zoom, if you have questions at any point throughout the entire program, uh, if you hover your mouse over the screen, a black bar should pop up on the bottom that has a little chat bubble. And if you have a question at any point, it doesn't matter when uh, throughout the program, go ahead and open that chat bubble and type in your question and make sure that it's being sent um, either to everybody or to me. Um, don't send anything directly to Suzanne because she's gonna be giving our presentation, not looking at all of your questions. Um, and I will make sure that all of our questions get answered at the end of the program tonight. Um, and for those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live, Hi, thank you for joining us. Um, if you have any questions throughout the evening, please go ahead and type them in the comment box um, underneath or next to the video. Um, and I will like it. Um, I will like it on Facebook if we've seen your um, comment or your question. Um, and we'll again ask them at the end of the program with all of the Zoom questions. If you get kicked off, for those of you who are on Zoom, feel free to rejoin. I will be monitoring that and. Um, if we're able to, we'll get you back on the program. Um, if not, you can always go to facebook.com slash Napa RCD. You don't have to have a Facebook account. Um, and the first thing that should come up for us will be this live feed. Um, so if you do get kicked off, you can still tune in that way. Uh, we are recording this video. So hopefully uh, by the end of this week or early next week, we will have this up on our YouTube page for all of you to view if you wanna share it with your friends or you know with, with your garden club or whoever it is that um, that you might want to share it with. So let's make sure we're recording and we're all set. And again, good evening. My name is Ashley. I'm the Community Engagement Project Manager with Napa RCD. And um, we are a non-regulatory agency here in Napa County. We do a whole bunch of different things. Um, but overall, what we do is we help you care for the land, water, soil, and wildlife here in Napa County. So we do that through government agencies, partnerships um, with nonprofits, all kinds of things. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, you can feel free to type those in the chat boxes as well. And I, I can answer those offline. I do wanna mention that this month is Bay Friendly Garden Month. Uh, we're really excited to be hosting a month long suite of programs. We have four different workshops from this particular workshop talking about bugs. Uh, we have a workshop talking about how to uh, garden with kids uh, how to make sure that you have a lovely garden that also will allow you to have lovely vases full of native flowers in your home um, and also a gray water workshop. So stay tuned. If you would like to see a full suite of those programs, it's at NapaRCD.org slash Garden Month 2021. And I can put that link in the chat boxes as well for folks. Uh, the Wild Series, so this is kind of a dual uh, program tonight. This is our Bay Friendly Garden Month workshop, but it's also our Wild Napa for the month of May. Um, and the Wild Napa series is only made possible through support of our partners. Um, our partners include the Watershed Information and Conservation Council, Friends of the Napa River, the Carolyn Parr Nature Center, Napa Valley Vintners, uh, the American Canyon, Canyon Community and Parks Foundation. Um, and this particular presentation, because it's part of Bay Friendly Garden Month, is also um, brought to you by the Napa Countywide Stormwater Pollution Prevention Program and the City of Napa and the UC Master Gardeners here in Napa County. So all of that being said, you are not here to listen to me. You are here for our program tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our speaker for this evening, who is Suzanne Bontempo. 
Suzanne is an environmental educator um, who gives talks throughout the Bay Area and I think beyond as well um, on topics related to things like integrated pest management and less harmful pesticide use in our gardens and um, in our you know, in our lives in general. So Suzanne, I will have you uh, take it away. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks everyone for joining us this evening. We're gonna talk about gardening for good bugs. Hopefully everyone's been noticing a lot of bugs in their garden and you're very curious if it's a good bug or a bad bug. So we're gonna learn tonight. So let's get started. I'm gonna go through slides for, I'd say 45 to 50 minutes. I do have a lot of content. I'm gonna to try to keep it short, but I just can't not like give you everything I, as much as I can. So, and then afterwards, yes, of course, we're gonna leave time for your questions, which I'm happy to answer at any, you know, beyond. And then what we're gonna to learn tonight are who are many of the common good bugs we're seeing in the garden, how they're helping us and how to keep them around. So as a program manager for Our Water, Our World, I just need to just give it a little shout out. This is a program that's designed to bring awareness between pesticides and water quality. It is a national award-winning program and we provide integrated pest management education to the public. That means we're talking to the public all the time about how to solve their pest problems with the less toxic approach. And you might recognize some of our materials at your local hardware stores or garden centers throughout Napa County. And then we have the fact sheets that you can take and read. They address certain pest problems like ants or aphids or yellow jackets. And then we also have these little blue shelf talkers that go under uh, eco-friendly products to identify which ones are not going to pose a threat to water quality. And we partner with water pollution prevention agencies and retail businesses to be able to provide, provide this information. So as an integrated pest management or IPM educator, I just like to share what integrated pest management is, because this is really the foundation of how we approach gardens as far as I'm concerned. And uh, beneficial insects is a big part of it. So IPM is a decision, is a decision making process that uses science based strategies to solve the pest problems. It's not made up. It's not, you know, um, whatever we've read on the internet. This is actually science-based. And it allows us to look at the system as a whole. In this case, it's gonna be the garden. And when we're looking at the system as a whole, we start to identify if there is a problem. And if there is a problem, we decide, is it something we can live with? And then if we need to take action, then we take a combination of actions, which is cultural controls, bolstering the health of the environment, uh, mechanical controls using tools to prevent certain pest problems, biological controls, which are using living organisms to prevent pest problems, which we're going to be talking about today, and then chemical controls, which are the pesticides. And when we use pesticides, we always want to really understand that we're going to use them kind of as a last resort and always the least toxic possible. So how does IPM apply to beneficial insects? Well, identification is the key. And then we want to set our gardens up for success so that they can grow really well without a lot of chemicals. We want to grow biodiversity, planting a variety of flowering uh, perennials, trees, shrubs, and so forth. And then we want to consider reducing or eliminating pesticides altogether. So we're going to start with a little test. So I hope everyone's paying attention. I hope everyone's really excited. So I did set this up for uh, a webinar, but what I'd like to invite everyone to do is to, uh, uh, I'd like to stop, like, I'd like to see everyone's face. I'd like to see everyone's face on the video. And I'd like everyone to be ready to, cause I don't think anyone has the raise hand icon, right? I think I'd like everyone to either raise their hand or in the Facebook Live, I'd like you to, okay, good, you can raise your hand, awesome. I'd like you to do the uh, thumbs up or any type of icon that you can you know, hit on your computer or on your phone for a Facebook Live. So we're going to go through. So if everyone's comfortable with the raised hand icon, okay, I see a few, awesome. All right, so. We see this little critter in the garden. Are we squishing it or are we not squishing? If we're squishing it, I wanna see a raised hand, either virtually or a little icon, anything that gives us a raised hand. Are we squishing this weird looking creepy crawler? 
I want to see some raised hands. Anybody? All right. Okay. No one's going to squish this one. Okay. Ashley, anyone on Facebook? Not yet. Okay. No. All right. All right. We see this creepy crawler. Are we going to squish this one? I want to see some raised hands. Are we squishing this one? Squish. Okay. I got some squishes. Okay. About time. Yeah. Ashley, anyone on Facebook? We have about a 10 to 15 second lag on Facebook. Um, so oh, right thanks for, yeah, that's right. Thanks for reminding me. Juliana says yes. Squish. Okay. All right. Right. We see this little sluggy thing. Are we squishing this one? I am pretty sure I would squish this. Yeah. We got some, we got some raised hands. Squish. Squish. Anyone on Facebook? Juliana says don't squish. Ah, oh, cutie. Francis says yes, squish. Okay. All right. Then we've got this one. Oh my gosh. Are we squishing this one? Who's going to raise their hands to squish this one? I don't even think I'd use my hand or my fingers. I'd probably use like a tool, like a, my, my um, trowel or like a stick or definitely would have my gloves on if I was going to squish this one. Yeah. This one is the weirdest looking one. Alien. It's like from Star Wars. Our Facebook viewers are fairly silent on this one. I think you've stumped them. Okay. All right. Well, guess what? They were all beneficial insects. Can you believe that? So let's meet our friends. So we all recognize this starlet, the lady beetle, AKA ladybug. So there's over 450 species of lady beetles in North America. Uh, that's a lot. They're going to come in a lot of different patterns and colors. So they could be all red or all orange, or they could be all red with just a couple dots or all black with two dots, or, um, you know, maybe they're gray with black dots or kind of tan, kind of khaki with black dots. But so they're going to vary in color and pattern, but they're all going to be predators. So they're cruising around just looking for soft bodied insects to eat. And throughout their entire lifespan, which could be anywhere from three months to over a year, depending on when they were born, uh, they could eat over 5,000 soft bodied insects. So that's going to be aphids. Um, it's going to be white fly nymphs. It's going to be spider mites. It's going to be other small insect eggs. Uh, it's going to be scale insects. So it's a very large variety. And they're only going to stick around if there's food. So if you are really wanting to attract uh, ladybugs, you better make sure we've got some aphids around or they're not going to hang out. And if you go to purchase some, you want to make sure you've got food for them to eat because they're going to be very hungry. But what I understand, it is documented that if you have a perimeter of the native buckwheat, I understand that they will not migrate past that. Now, I have not had this experience. I do have buckwheat in my garden. They do like it. But I also make sure I have a lot of plants that they like. I have a nice habitat for them. And I've got a lot of aphids for them to eat. And a habitat is going to look like maybe having a variety of a couple trees, some shrubs, some perennials, a variety of flowering plants. We're going to have chunky mulch in some areas of the garden. And whenever I have to prune a branch from one of my larger shrubs or my trees, I usually kind of make it as part of a border for my walkways or I'll have it like in an area of the garden that looks aesthetic. 
because they're going to actually use these areas where there's down limbs or chunky mulch as nesting areas and also as a kind of protection for them. All right. So for all of you that did not want to squish this friend, I hope you all knew that it was the ladybug larva, which is out in large numbers right now. My entire garden is swarming with them. So they look like little tiny alligators. They are going to be very small. They typically are going to be anywhere from about, oh gosh, I saw one today that was really tiny, about an eighth of an inch, all the way up to about just under a half of an inch. So extremely tiny. And similar to the adult, they're also going to vary in colors. So some can be all black, some can be uh, this charcoal kind of dark gray with black and orange splotches. Some have like reddish orange stripes on their sides. Some are going to be all gray or this dark with kind of lighter gray splotches. So just understand they're all going to be uh, ladybug larva, but they could look a little different. And again, they are going to be strictly consuming protein meals. They are going on the hunt for insects, which will include aphids and other soft bodied insects like the scale insects, the spider mites, the small insect eggs. And they're gonna be in this form for about two to four weeks before they emerge as an adult lady beetle. So does anyone recognize what these are? Oops, sorry. These are lady beetle pupas. So when they go from that ladybug larvae, they'll find a little spot just to curl up and you see these little dome shapes. And similar to the adults and the larva, they can range in color, anywhere from all orange to all dark gray and black. So, and they're going to attach themselves to leaves. In this case, on the right, it's a bamboo stake that was in the garden. I see them on the sides of pottery or on raised beds. They're all about, and they're going to be in this stage, transforming from, transitioning from a larvae to an adult. It takes about five to 15 days. So you can check them out. And then these, of course, are the lady beetle eggs, which you'll find underneath the leaves of many plants where you see a lot of aphids because they're going to lay their eggs in these little uh, clusters of anywhere from five to 30 around where there's going to be aphids because they know that the minute these hatch, they want their young to start eating. They're gonna be hungry because that's kind of their entire job is just to eat. So the eggs are going to uh, emerge, the larva is going to emerge uh, after like two to five days and understand an adult lady beetle can lay around a thousand eggs from spring through summer. So that's a lot of ladybugs. All right, does anyone recognize this friend? This is our green lacewing. Green lacewings we commonly see in the gardens fluttering about. They're actually feeding on nectar. We also might notice them around the porch lights at night. And depending on the weather and the season, they're gonna live four to six weeks. So here's one in my garden feeding on the nectar and the pollen from one of my narcissus. So they're strictly going to be feeding off of nectar and pollen and also they're going to be feeding off of the honeydew, that uh, sugary sweet secretion that soft bodied insects create such as aphids. So that sticky substance that we see when aphid, there's a big aphid infestation, they're feeding off of that. So for those of you that did not want to squish this little creepy crawler, well, it's the lady, um, it's the green lacewing larva, <clears throat> excuse me. It's the green lacewing larva. He's really tiny. He's going to be um, anywhere from like three eighths of an inch up to about a half an inch. But whenever I've seen them in person, which is rare, they're really tiny. So it's they seem like they're really small and you wouldn't recognize them. But when you see them, you definitely recognize them because of their spines on their back and these piercing mouth parts. They look kind of crazy. They have a huge appetite. All they want to do is eat. They are a super predator and they're eating soft bodied insects, small insect eggs, small caterpillars at the rate of one per minute. Their nickname, because they have such a hearty appetite, is called 
aphid lion. So they are just crazy for aphids. All they want to do is just eat them like popcorn. And they're going to feast in addition to aphids on thrips, spider mites, mealybugs, white fly nymphs, small caterpillars, and so forth, like I just mentioned. They're going to eat hundreds during the time that they're in the stage, which is about two to three weeks. So um, then we have these interesting things. Oops, sorry. These interesting things. These are actually the lacewing eggs. So if you've seen a lacewing fluttering around your garden, you're going to want to take a closer look to your plants, especially near an aphid infestation. And you're going to want to see if you recognize or notice any of these little tiny eggs that are on a little stalk that's about a quarter inch long. These eggs are going to be anywhere from ivory to like kind of a limey green. And the reason why the lacewing lay their eggs on this little stalk is because if they were to lay their eggs all next to each other like the ladybugs did, the first one that would hatch would eat the all of the other eggs. They would eat all of their siblings. So here's another one next to this aphid infestation that the lady beetles have already taken care of. So these are our lady beetle larvae that are all black and they're totally chowing down on some aphids. And so when that little lacewing larva hatches, there's not gonna be any food. He's gonna have to cruise around looking for some food. Anyway, so uh, the way to attract the lacewings is to, um, they because they love the nectar of uh, flowers, you're gonna wanna plant a variety of flowers such as asters, like in my photo here, uh, or anything in the carrot family. So that would be uh, plants like uh, parsley, cilantro, dill, letting them go to flower. We'd also look at asters, sunflowers, goldenrod, um, even borage and arugula. I've seen them nesting or laying their eggs next to and enjoying the flowers. So having a variety of flowers that's going to really invite the lacewing adult is going to ensure you to have some lacewing eggs, which will certainly um, get you some lacewing larvae. Now, if you have a bunch of uh, pest insects in your garden and you're like, I just don't understand why I don't have ladybugs or lacewings, you know, I've got the bugs, I've got the plants, what's going on? I'm not using the pesticides. So here you do, this is what you do. You take one tablespoon of sugar and one cup of water and you mix it up in a spray bottle and you spray your plants where you know you've got aphid infestations, that's going to invite them. That's kind of a like sneaky tip. All right, anyone notice who this one is? This is our serpent fly or hover fly or flower fly. A lot of different names for this friend. This is not a bee or a wasp. Uh, they do not have a stinger, although they do have stripes. Uh, it is a true fly. There's many different um, species of flower flies or serpent flies in North America and around California and the Bay Area. Uh, I just recently learned that there's like 600 species. So I have noticed that there's a lot of different varieties in my garden. Some are much smaller than others, but what is very specific about them is that they do have these stripes and they do buzz around the garden kind of like a helicopter Well, they'll buzz over and they'll stop and hover and then they'll buzz over here and they'll hover and they'll buzz around. And there's just strictly a pollinator. They are pollinating our flowers for us. So they're really important. And I always love to invite them. They love yarrow, but um, in addition to loving yarrow, they really love sweet Alyssa. So I'll, you know, if I'm ever at the garden center and I'm buying um, any like vegetables or any food crops, I'm always picking up a six pack or two of sweet Alyssa to dot around my garden. Now, we recognize this. This is our hoverfly or serpent fly larva. Now, I've got a lot of these in my garden right now, which I really love. Now, this is going to be a very tiny, very, very tiny little like caterpillar or little like worm. Now, understand, since the serpent fly is a true fly, then this is that word we don't really like to use a lot, maggot. Now, I'm not sure if anyone has noticed it on the rosebud. There it is. 
This is going to vary in color anywhere from being a very light limey green, like the picture on the left, to kind of this khaki kind of tannish olive color, like the picture on the right, all the way to kind of like creamy translucent. But the one discerning factor is there's always a white racing stripe down its back. So if you see a little tiny little worm likey on your plants that has that white racing stripe, you know very well that it's a serpent fly larva. And they're going to be either super tiny, a 32nd of an inch, all the way up to half an inch. So there is a lot of range. Now, they absolutely love aphids. You're going to go and notice them wherever there's an aphid um, population, specifically on roses, for some reason, I always see them on roses, but they're also gonna be on yarrow, on rosemary, on lots of different plants. In addition to aphids, they're also eating spider mites, thrips, uh, scale insects. So they do have a nice range, but they absolutely love um, aphids and they're gonna eat hundreds of insects during their lifespan. So here's another one, you see them? Isn't it fun? I like to do my little morning and evening hunts for my um, beneficial insects. It's pretty fun. All right. This is going to be the serpent fly egg. And what you're going to see is around an aphid infestation, you're going to just see a single egg that's just there laying there hanging out. So uh, just check them out. Note that it's going to um, be a beneficial insect and don't wipe it off. All right, oh, something else that the her, her, uh, serpent flies love is against the cilantro in bloom. I will get my cilantro and specifically just for the flower and I just use the leaves as an herb as it's growing. But let me tell you, when you have cilantro or parsley in flower, you're gonna see all of these little tiny black flies and all of these little uh, look like the mini wasps hovering. That's your beneficial insects. Okay. All right, so remember this one? This is a mealy bug destroyer. Have you ever heard of that? It is a ladybug. It's in the lady beetle family. Uh, the lady beetle is very, very tiny. She's just a sixth of an inch. And the, uh, the larva is actually going to be twice as big and as, as large as half of an inch, but they are going to be hanging out where there is mealybugs because they absolutely love mealybugs. Uh, they're also gonna be eating other things like aphids and scale insects and spider mites and so forth. And in fact, I, for the first time in my life, just saw some in my garden eating aphids along with the ladybug larva. I was completely surprised. I was very excited, but, understand that these little uh, friends will have a very short lifespan of a, just about two months, but they will consume hundreds of soft-bodied insects. So they are definitely doing a great job. Um, they, the larva has um, over the years adapted this look so that it could sneak up on the mealybugs. And they are going to be pretty fast. So a way to identify them is that they're cruising around and they're also about twice the size of a mealybug. So the next time you have a mealybug infestation on your plants, take a closer look just to confirm that you don't have these critters because sadly they're mistaken because they look so similar to mealybugs and oftentimes they're taken out by pesticides. So anyway, super fun. Oh, here they are. See, I had these on my plants and I was so excited. So they look really weird. In fact, this one is eating an aphid and they're cruising right next to the lady beetle. So they're really small, but kind of fun. Oh, there's the ladybug beetle. There's another one. And there's another one. So yeah, just look around your garden. You're going to see a whole like colony of insects helping you out. All right, now this is a very strange situation. These are parasitic wasps. These are wasps that um, part of their life are going to live on or in a host insect. They're gonna be extremely tiny, in fact, minuscule. Um, sometimes these wasps are laying their eggs inside their host insect, at which point then that egg hatches and then that larva is eating the inside of that insect or they're laying it on top of their host in the case of this uh, tomato hornworm. 
where when they hatch, they're going to burrow in. So kind of creepy. These are going to be wasps that do not swarm us. They want nothing to do with us. And in fact, we don't even recognize them as wasps because they're tiny. They're like the size of fungus gnats, if not smaller. So they, again, are going to be the ones swarming that cilantro flower or that parsley flower. So know that they are out there just, you know, feeding off of those flowers, but they are definitely doing some good work for you. Now check this out. This is crazy. So if you have um, specifically an evergreen plant, such as a camellia, this is, these are, this is a camellia leaf that was brought into one of the nurseries I was working at. And the manager knew that I would really love seeing this. Uh, these are actually aphid mummies. And what that means is that that little parasitic wasp is laying its egg inside the aphid. So it's gotta be tiny if it's laying an egg inside an aphid, which is already tiny. And then when the egg hatches, the larva will eat the inside of the aphid. It'll look like, um, like a little like rice crispy, like a puffed rice. And um, then it will cut a perfectly round circle out of the back and emerge as an adult um, uh, parasitic wasp. So if you see these little mummies or these little puffed rice with perfect little holes around other aphids, just know that you have parasitic wasp. You do not need to go for the pesticide. They're definitely taking care of the problem for you. So very popular on citrus, very popular on camellias and other evergreen plants. Really fun. This is where they got the idea for that movie Aliens. Kind of creepy. All right. This is another friend of ours, the soldier beetle. They're swarming my garden right now. I'm sure they're swarming yours as well. They are in the same family as a firefly or lightning bug, but they just don't have that light producing organ. They're going to be about a half an inch long. They're a little larger than the other ones we've talked about. And they are strictly enjoying the pollen and the nectar off of flowers. They are not doing any damage to the leaves or the flowers whatsoever. However, they are also feeding off of the honeydew, the secretions from some of the soft bodied insects, as well as the soft bodied insects. So they're kind of doing a lot. They're doing a little bit of all of the above. And they're just going to cruise around pollinating our flowers and going from plant to plant, uh, flying around, cruising. They're a lot of fun. But their larva, their larva is going to be in the soil. So they're going to lay their eggs in the soil. That larva is going to hatch. That larva is going to look like a small alligator, similar to the um, ladybug larva and the green lacewing larva. And they're actually going to be eating any of the ground dwelling insects, you know, like um, little crickets or little beetles, things like that. So they're doing a lot of good work for us. And they're typically about the first to emerge in the spring. And again, hundreds of insects that they can consume during their, uh, their lifespan, which is a few weeks. All right. So I like to always give the dragonflies a little shout out. I feel like we forget about them sometimes, but because where we live is surrounded by water, marshy areas, ponds, lakes, and creeks, you know, the dragonflies are really important because that's where they're going to lay their eggs. Their, leg, their eggs are extremely tiny. They're like, if you were to make a dot on the paper with a ballpoint pen, that's how tiny their eggs are. And they typically scatter their eggs um, on the waterways or they tuck them into vegetation that is floating on the water or they're gonna be in muddy stream bottoms. And those eggs are gonna hatch and they're gonna be larvae that's going to be living in that water anywhere from a couple of weeks to a couple of years. So because they can be in the water for such a long time, it's really important that we understand that a lot of the chemicals that we use, specifically pesticides, can actually be very toxic to them when they get to the waterways. Because remember, everything ends up in the waterways. So I just like to ask that we just like to give our dragonflies a little bit of support by choosing products that will not pose a threat to our waterways. But then once they hatch, these dragonflies have an amazing job where they fly around. Do you see their little legs look like a little basketball hoop? In midair, they're flying around. They'll catch anything that's flying, like a fungus gnat, a mosquito, a fly, anything that's flying around, and they'll just pop it in their mouth like a little popcorn snack. It's amazing. They can eat hundreds, hundreds 
of mosquitoes in their lifespan. And they're cruising around three miles from where their home is in that marshy area, that lake, that creek, that pond, just cruising out there, hunting for uh, insects to eat. It's pretty fun. Now, there is something I can share. There is a product that a lot of times we use to prevent mosquito uh, infestations. They're called mosquito dunks or mosquito bits. These pose no threat to the dragonfly larva. So keep using those mosquito bits, keep using those mosquito dunks to keep mosquitoes from having a big population because they are not hurting anything else but those mosquitoes. All right. So I'm sorry for those of you that don't like spiders. Spiders are kind of creepy for some of us. I try to pick some good pictures. The three pictures of the crab spiders are actually from my garden. I'm a huge fan of crab spiders. And then this little one in the corner is from the internet, which I thought was very cute. But I'd like to share that most spiders are not web weavers. There's just a small percentage that are actually weaving the webs. And those are going to be, we'll see, you know, of course, closer to Halloween where we have to walk through the garden and kind of go like this to make sure we don't get a web in our face. But most of our common garden spiders are actually hanging out at the base of a plant or the base of a flower waiting for their prey to come. So, uh, and there are a lot of times they're very tiny. And let me tell you, they do not want to see us. They do not like us. They don't want to be next to us. They don't want to affect us at all. So I know um, that a lot of us are afraid, but understand that spiders are the most beneficial insect globally. There are spiders on every continent. And if you were to gather up all the food, all the insects, that all the spiders eat in a year, it's gonna equal the weight of 50 million people. So when I see a spider, I don't like them in my house, trust me. I don't mind them in the garden, but I don't like them in the house. I will scoop them up and get them outside because what I know is that these spiders are eating something that's less desirable. So I have a lot more tolerance now that I know the great work they're doing, but I also wanna make sure they're only outside. So this looks really weird. What the heck is this? These are beneficial nematodes. So this is something that you normally would never see unless you had your microscope. And these are actually going to, there's a number of different species of beneficial nematodes. They actually live in the soil and they feed off of soil dwelling insects such as uh, grubs, um, um, cucumber beetle larva, weevil larva, um, fungus gnat larva, of ant colonies, flea larvae, uh, root maggots, and so many more, cutworms, cabbage uh, moth maggots, uh, just so much. So root knot nematodes. So just know that we can purchase these to address a lot of pest problems that are in our gardens, but that they are really doing an amazing job. Now check this out. So when I said that they're microscopic worm-like organisms, this is the nematodes attacking a fungus gnat larva. So a fungus gnat larva is already really tiny and here they are attacking it. So it's kind of cool. Now, of course, we also want to just give a shout out to our bees and other pollinators. Um, there's a uh, 70% of our native bees are actually ground dwellers. 30% are going to live up in, you know, uh, wood nesters. And then, of course, there's our European honeybees. Our pollinators are out there cruising around doing a lot of work for us, providing um, larger harvest yields for our gardens, but then also doing an amazing job keeping our flowers happy and healthy. So there's over 1,600 species of native bees in California. And um, there's, it's kind of fun since um, we've been sheltering in our homes and gardens a little more over the year. It's been really fun to get out in my garden and notice that there's a lot more species that I didn't know about and I got to learn about. So just go outside and have a little look and see if you can find any interesting native bees that you maybe weren't aware of. So let's talk about how we invite the beneficials. A lot of times we want to make sure that we uh, don't forget the flowers and that we plant a diversity of flowers. So what do these flowers have in common? Well, we have some yarrow and we have some alyssum in the bottom left corner. And what those are are tiny flowers in clusters. And then the other flowers that we have, such as the gallardia, the ridgeron, the cosmos, similar to this aster here, 
These all might look like a single flower to us, but those petals are actually rays. And in the center, that coin or that button, it's actually hundreds of tiny little flowers. And the reason why that's so important is because most of our beneficial insects that we've already looked at are extremely tiny. And since they're going to be nectar and pollen feeders, we wanna provide them places where they can get that nectar and pollen from flowers that are tiny. So we want to plant plants that look like daisies or sunflowers, such as erigeron, cosmos, asters, and so forth, or flowers that grow in clusters of tiny flowers, like the parsley, the cilantro, the ceanothus, yarrow, and so forth. If we plant these flowers, trust me, they are going to come to your garden. And so for more information on uh, finding plant lists that can provide you with uh, flowers that are going to attract beneficial insects, you can always look at the Napa County um, UC Master Gardeners. You can also look at the Our Water Our World website because we've got these really great handouts, the Healthy Gardens Fact Sheet and the 10 Most Wanted Good Bugs in Your Garden that have plant lists. And then of course the California Native Plant Society. So beyond the garden, we have Beyond the beneficial insects, we also have birds and frogs and bats and lizards, salamanders and snakes. Understand birds do an amazing job feeding off of a lot of pests that come to our garden, such as the little caterpillars, the cabbage moth, caterpillars and so forth, um, as well as the frogs. This little guy was in one of my string bean teepees doing a really great job eating aphids. They, but beyond that, they also eat slugs and snails and, all kind, and flies and all kinds of things that are gonna be great, as well as our bats. We have hundreds of species of bats in California understand that they are going to uh, do a, an amazing job at taking care of the small insects at night, such as the mosquitoes and moths. And then of course, our Western fence lizard, and this is super cool. So our Western fence lizards cruise around, but did you know when a tick happens to come over to feed off of the blood of the lizard, there is a protein in the lizard's blood that neutralizes Lyme's disease. That is why Lyme's disease is not as a big of a deal here in California as it is on the East because of our amazing Western fence lizard. But in addition to that, they're eating uh, little crickets and beetles and other uh, small insects. So these are all going to be really amazing, great friends for us. So how do we set our gardens up for success? We are going to plant a variety of trees and shrubs and perennials of just have a nice variety of flowering plants. We're going to offer a little water source that could just be a little small glazed saucer that has some pebbles in it that we filled with water. Those pebbles act as a landing pad for these small insects so they don't drown. We're going to let a number of the flowers go to seed after their season. We're not going to deadhead everything because this is also going to attract the birds. We're gonna use like a chunkier mulch uh, that we get like at a landscape supply or the local garden center because this is going to provide shelter and hiding place for many of our beneficial insects. And we're gonna leave part of the garden raw and uncultivated. We're not gonna put mulch there. We're not gonna dig around a lot because a lot of our bees, as I mentioned, are ground nesting bees and they're going to take advantage of any abandoned beetle tunnels and so forth. And then most of all, we wanna reduce and avoid pesticides, even eco-friendlies. So when we use pesticides, we wanna use as a last resort. We want to make sure we know the pest and we're only gonna target that pest. We're not spraying the entire garden. We're going to spot, we're gonna spot apply. We're gonna avoid spraying everything as I just mentioned. We're gonna choose eco-friendlies and less toxic, but understand if beneficial insects are present, they're also going to be impacted by the beneficial, uh, the eco-friendly pesticides. We're gonna spray at the end of the day when our pollinators and our beneficials are less active. And then we always wanna avoid uh, spraying a tree or a shrub when it's in full bloom because oftentimes beneficial insects and pollinators are visiting it during that time. And then we wanna understand the consequences of our actions. And we specifically want to make sure that we really look out for products containing neonicotinoids. These are going to be pesticides that are either applied as a soil drench or we're spraying them on the plant. They work systemically where they move through the cell structure of that plant 
even into the pollen. So if there is any pollinators visiting it, they're going to be impacted by this pesticide. So to learn more about the pesticides that you might use around your property, there is this really awesome resource called B Precaution Pesticide Rating at the UC IPM website. This is going to be really helpful. And then from there, we want to make sure that we can always properly identify the pests. If we can't identify the pests, it's going to be really challenging to actually you know, manage that pest. We want to understand the life cycle. We want to understand the habitat and the timing of that pest. And then we want to know, are there any beneficial insects present that might be feeding off of that pest? So it's really hard to properly identify pests. So here's a couple of things I want to share. This is a mealy bug destroyer. This is a flea beetle. They're about the same size. They're doing two different things. The flea beetle is actually feeding off of the foliage of little seedlings, while the ladybug destroyer is feeding off mealybugs. But this is a good bug. This is a bad bug. Super easy to mistake. And again, we have a cucumber beetle, which is a pest. We have a mildew eating lady beetle, which is a beneficial. So again, bad bug, good bug. And then lastly, we have the damsel bug and the leaf footed bug. Again, a good bug and a bad bug. So it is not easy to identify pests. I even have a challenging time. So what I'd like to share with you are some really amazing resources. Of course, we have the Our Water, Our World website, which has all these fact sheets that help you with pest problem solving. But in addition, it's the UC IPM website. And what we wanna do is we always wanna be able to identify the plant. If we can identify the plant, that's the first step in identifying what the bug is. Because on the UCIPM website, we just type in in that search bar what the plant is. If it's rosemary, then all the pests that rosemary could possibly get will come up. And that helps us identify through process of elimination what we have. In addition, the UCIPM website has these amazing quick tips that talk about all the different types of lady beetles that we might uh, discover in our garden, as well as beneficial predators. And then this is really fun. And this has been super important to me when I cannot identify what that bug is, I will take a picture of it and I will email it to thebugguide.net. And I'm telling you within about 30 minutes, I get an email reply telling me what that bug is. This is such a cool resource. I encourage you to check it out before you go for that pesticide or before you go to squish it. And then this is another really cool website I'd like you to know about, which is our National Pesticide Information Center. Not only will this website tell you what that active ingredient is, how it works, what's the mode of action, but it also has this really cool um, natural enemies quick list so that you can also kind of do a cross identification. So in close, what I'd like to share that when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. Everything's connected. So I hope that this program has inspired you to get outside to discover some new garden allies. And here it is, my favorite serpent fly landed on my thumb. They're just so precious. They're so special. And it is so much fun to discover new beneficial insects just in our own gardens. So I want to thank you so much for joining. I tried to keep it within the 45 minutes. I was fast and furious. So uh, I'd love to finish with your questions. If any questions come up later, please never hesitate to reach out to me. Awesome, thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, right now we don't have any questions, which seems kind of crazy to me, um, but maybe we're gonna call it a night early, I don't know. Yeah, uh, let's, go ahead. Some, sometimes people take a minute because they are so like, whoa. Yeah, one thing I'll say is I've used uh, the bug guide multiple times. Yeah. I love it. It is so fun. Even if you don't have a bug that you're looking for, just like go there and look through yeah. all the different kinds of bugs that they have found and they have identified for folks. It's really, really interesting. And there are some very weird looking bugs in this world. Yeah. Um, well, it's entertaining just, you know. It is. <laughs> it's an amazing resource. I love it. In fact, I just recently saw a bug I wasn't familiar with and I was trying to key it out myself with all of my bug books. And I was pretty sure that it was a bad bug and I was going out there and it was pretty big. It looked like a stink bug, but it was a little different. And I was going out and I was knocking them in soapy water. And then I was like, cause I was like, oh, maybe I should send the picture to the bug 
guide. And I was like, no, no, I feel like I do that too much. Never too much because now I just learned it might be a beneficial. So I'm, I'm right after this program, I'm emailing them a picture because uh, you always have to know what you're, um, what you're killing. <laughs> right. It could be a good bug. And why would you want to do that? It's so sad anyway. Um, so Ralph has a question. Um, do, does ground reserved for native bees need to be cleared of vegetation or simply left untouched? Beautiful question. Just simply left untouched. So you, they'll, you know, oftentimes around uh, nice perennial um, borders, I will put my mulch out quite far so that it will still protect the soil and the root zones of those plants, but it's really far, like maybe a good foot or so from my perennials so that the ground is uncultivated, but still available for the ground nesters. Thanks. We have a question from Facebook from Francis. My milkweed has always attracted tons of aphids. Often they seem to prevent it from fruiting. Do you have any advice for intervening? You, if you do not see any beneficial insects there, go ahead and wipe them off. Easy peasy. That was the easiest answer to that yeah. question. Yeah. I was expecting a lot more to come out of that. Just wipe them off. Easy. Yeah, just wipe them off. I, I know that there's a little bit more to it. I think that there's a symbiotic relationship between those aphids and that milkweed. But um, when it's excessive, just wipe them off. Um, question from Danielle. Is the only way to get rid of bad bugs to kill them? Or are there ways to deter them so that you don't have to deal with them in the first place? Yes. Well, one, planting a garden that attracts beneficial insects so that that balance is always there because it's part of this beautiful ecosystem where we have, I mean, that's just natural. That's nature. There's, you know, it's part of the cycle of the garden. But if, uh, if that's the case that you want to get, um, I would say that there are some plants that, um, I've heard can act as repellents. Mm -hmm. However, it, I'm not sure how scientific that is. I mean, I always plant my marigolds with my tomatoes, but I have professional friends that say that's hogwash, but I just always do it, but I also like the way it looks, but I also will dot alyssum around all of my vegetables because I know that's also attracting beneficials. Mm -hmm. But um, I just recently read that or oregano will um, prevent cucumber beetles from um, in, uh, infesting your cucumber plants. So I thought, why not? Let's try, let's see if that helps. So I have no idea, but you know, there's these like things you can read about and try, but I also like to just know that it's like, I'm just trying something that I read about. It wasn't scientifically like, you know, uh, figured out. So that's just like, you know, just take it, I guess, with a little bit of a personal experimental grain of salt. So. so, so Ralph just asked a question that prompts um, myself and also Danielle to ask a question. Um, what is the most successful way to catch and keep bugs that I want to identify? Oh yeah. So um, what I'll do is I get a little tiny like mason jar or any type of just little, you know, glass clear jar or even just a little, um, gosh, like a little vitamin container, just pop them in and put them in the freezer. Oh. Yeah, and then they're frozen and then you can take them out later and take better pictures of them and they don't um, like disintegrate or start to decompose in the freezer. So that, that answers the question that I had that um, Danielle had as well. How are you getting such great photos um, of some of the bugs that you've shown us tonight? Oh, these? Well, a lot of, uh, they're either from my garden or I got them like from UCIPM or the other uh, photo credits were mentioned throughout the slides. But I have a lot of bugs in my garden <laughs> and I'm very patient and I have a lot of photos that didn't really work out. <laughs> uh, so follow up question from Ralph, um, when you're trying to catch those bugs and put them in a jar, um, are you just that skilled that you can just like catch them right in a jar or do you use a net and then transfer them to the jar? 
<laughs> uh, you kind of sneak up on them and like early morning or late afternoon, you know, like right now is a good time because it seems like during the cool part of the day, they're not that active during the heat of the day. They're more likely to, you know, fly away or do whatever they do. But yeah, you can kind of knock them into, um, I mean, I have like, uh, like a larger jar, like a pint sized jar that I can just knock them in and then put, but uh, you can also use clear, like, like sticky tape, like you can get clear sticky tape and kind of try to uh, get them to stick to the tape without smashing mm -hmm. them. But that's also really, I find I'm not as delicate as just like knocking them into a jar. Right. Um, I don't see any more questions. I haven't had any questions come through from Facebook. So those of you tuning in uh, through Facebook, type in your questions now or they may not get asked. Um, and if anybody has any final questions um, through Zoom, go ahead and type those in. While um, all of you are thinking of your last scramble for questions, um, I wanted to share that our next program as part of Bay Friendly Garden Month is going to be a workshop um, about uh, gardening for the vase. So creating a garden in your yard um, that is beautiful and fulfills you visually, um, but will also provide you with cut flowers for your garden or to give to friends or what have you. Um, and that's going to be with um, a really wonderful partner, um, a really wonderful friend of NEP RCD, Jamie Georgie of the Monkey Flower Group. So that's going to be um, next Thursday, May 20th. Um, and it's going to be a similar program like this. It's going to be hosted on Zoom and on Facebook Live. So you can um, tune in in both of those different ways. Um, and I popped the, um, the website for Garden Month into both of the chats. So it's napRCD.org slash Garden Month 2021. Um, and that lists all of the different programs that we have, along with some resources from last year and just like other water wise um, resources for you to use. And it looks like Juliana does have a question. Oh, good. Uh, so we have aphids on our broccoli plants. Mm -hmm. We are using neem oil and it doesn't seem to work. We don't see very much, we don't see any beneficial bugs. We don't have any more uh, broccoli florets. Should we just cut the plants? Um, like kind of cut the heads off of them or, um, or leave them so that the good bugs can be attracted. Is, are the broccoli plants past their prime? Are they starting to bolt and go to flower? I don't know if we wait 40 seconds for the yeah. live on Facebook to catch up, we might be able to get an answer from her about that. Okay. Um, but I'm not sure. So she says that we don't have any more for it. So it might okay. be that it's sort of done. So in the meantime, um, understand the way neem works. Neem is very broad spectrum. So it's going to kill a very broad spectrum of insects, but sometimes it could take about four days before we see those insects um, die. But in the meantime, the other components of neem that are actually more, I think more valuable to that product is that they have, um, an anti-feeding property that when we spray it on the plant, insects are less likely to come in and feed off of it. That means coming in to feed off it. If they're already there, like specifically aphids, aphids have um, a sucking mouth part where they like, their mouth parts kind of like a straw where they pierce the leaf and they're just like sucking the juices from the leaf like a straw. So they're already like there. The neem oil will prevent new insects from coming in, but it also is going to have this um, uh, growth regulator component, which is very strange, where it will prevent those aphids from laying eggs. It'll prevent any eggs from hatching. Um, so it's a little, neem is kind of challenging for, for me because of this, that if we are, if we just want to see insects dead, that's not what we're going to see. If we want to, um, I would probably start with just blasting the aphids off with water, if that's the case. And then if that wasn't giving me the results I wanted, I would probably work with an insecticidal soap, not something you made at home, unless you're making it with Castile soap because Castile soap is the only true soap. Anything else is a detergent and it's going to be more harmful to your plants. Um, or buy insecticidal soap from your garden center, which is what I do, and follow the directions and apply it accordingly. But um, it's way narrow spectrum. It's a lot more narrow spectrum. It's only going to impact soft-bodied insects. So it's going to be, um, uh, I guess, 
well, yeah, neem is just broad spectrum. You're going to kill anything that's there. So if you're worried about beneficial insects, you know, but then also insecticidal soap will also kill them if it's the larvae form of any of the ones we had. So anyway, uh, yeah, blast with water, um, maybe try a different product that, you know, insecticidal soap that you might see the instant results. Gotcha. Long answer to the question. Reiterate that, yes, the florets have already been cut um, and they ate them. Hopefully they were delicious. Yeah. Um, I don't see any other questions. So I think um, we can go ahead and call it a night. I would like to just say thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, it was nice to see um, the couple of you that left your cameras on. It was nice to see your faces. Um, and thanks for those of you who joined us on Facebook as well. Um, it's always nice to know that people are excited about Garden Month and, you know, trying to you know, make our world a better place for our, you know, beneficial insects and, and all of that. So thanks so much for joining us. And we hope to see you um, next Thursday, May 20th for our gardening for the vase program at 7 p.m. Um, thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, thank thank you. you so, so much. We're so happy that you came back and did a program for us this year. Um, and you. we hope to have you back soon. Yeah. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a nice evening. You're all awesome. Have fun in your garden. <laughs>